The Ministry of Secondary Education has developed a distance learning platform for students of secondary education in Cameroon. A series of lessons taught by qualified teachers for secondary school students. Under the stewardship of Professor Pauline Nalovalyonga, in collaboration with the Ministry of Posts and Telecommunications, CAMTEL, CRTV and UNESCO. We are introducing distance learning as another teaching and learning method which is different from the traditional classroom setting that you are all used to. In the distance education mode, you are not with the teacher in person, so take your time, relax, listen to the teacher, take down notes and visit the following links for any questions or answers to your questions. Take it in your stride. This is Cameroon's solution to COVID-19 and beyond. Professor Nalova Lyunga, Minister of Secondary Education. Welcome to lesson 11 of your distance learning session with, in all level geology with Sunday Desmond. In our last lesson, that was lesson 10, there was this assignment which it was for you to list the evidences of seafloor spreading. We are supposed to list the evidences of seafloor spreading. Just list, not describe. And so, these are the evidences that prove that the seafloor is actually spreading. We start with the first one, which is dating samples of rocks from the seafloor. Dating samples of rocks from the seafloor. So, scientists are able to collect samples of rocks on both sides of a mid-oceanic bridge and date. And when that is done, we find that the ages of those rocks that have been collected on both sides of that mid-oceanic ridge at the same distances are having the same ages. So that is one of the proofs that support the theory of seafloor spreading. We have seafloor topography, like the basin geosynclines. We have paleomagnetism. That's the record of past magnetism of the Earth, which is indicated by normal and reversal magnetism in the rocks of the seafloor. We have evidences from heat flow. Evidences from heat flow, and we also have evidence from other geologic features like island arc, guillot, and sea mount. So those are some of the evidences that you can use to support the fact that the sea floor is actually spreading. Now, the lesson for today shall be or is part of the lesson that we already started, which is tectonics. And in tectonics, we started with the theory of sea floor spreading. We've seen plate tectonics. Today, we shall be looking at lesson 11, which is the concept of continental drift. The concept of continental drift. That is our lesson for today. The plan or overview of this lesson shall be, we have lesson objectives, we look at the prerequisites, real life situation, lesson activities, exercises, and we'll end with the assignment, just like we have always done. Now, at the end of this lesson, you will be able to talk about the theory or to describe the theory that explain continental drift. That is the theory of continental drift. You will be able to describe the mechanism of continental drift, or rather the mechanisms of continental drift, and also know the limitations and effect of continental drift. What are the limitations and effect of this theory of continental drift. For us to attain these competencies and objectives, it is expected that you have knowledge 
on geologic structures like faults, faults, seismology, that is, you're supposed to have a good knowledge on seismology, the science of earthquakes, sea floor spreading, which is one of the lessons that we have seen in this topic, tectonics. We have volcanism, which is the different processes in which molten material from the earth interior intrudes into or out of the earth, is brought into the earth or out of the or at the surface. The process in which molten material from the earth interior, the molten material is magma and all the rock are brought into the earth or at the surface of the earth. Then you also have the notion of mountain building. That takes us to the real life situation of our lesson. We have a block diagram on the board. You observe it, the picture, and together we will be able to deduce the concept that can be used to explain what the diagram is showing. Remember, if you focus up here, we have a date 200 million years ago. What was there? Coming down, we have 135 million years, 35 million years, and to present day. You find that as time is progressing, there are certain changes that has been occurring on those different, on what we have on your screen. What geologic concept can or will be used to describe the phenomenon illustrated on the picture? That is a scientific problem. And so, will it be the earth has not been the same since its origin? Will it be the notion of volcanism Will it be the notion of seismology or the concept of continental drift theory? Which of these hypotheses are or is can be used to describe what we have uh, as the problem? Now, let us look at what we have on the screen. There is a picture of a globe, and you find there boldly written Pangea, and you have the brown portion which represents a block of continent. Block of continent that are found together. What exactly is that picture talking about? That takes us to the lesson of the day, which is the theory of continental drift. The theory of continental drift. Now, Alfred Wegener in 1915 published a book that was titled The Origin of the Continent and Oceans. Alfred Wegener in 1915 published a book that was titled The Origin of the Continent and Ocean. And this book was later it was read and later considered as Wegener's theory of continental drift. Wegener's theory of continental drift. So what exactly is he talking about? Now, this theory states that, the theory states that the earth was once a single landmass that later split into blocks and drifted into present position as continent. Now, some years back, millions of years back, of course, the earth was a single landmass, and with time, that single landmass or a block split, split it, drifted and separated, giving rise to what? Present day continent, or what we call the present day continent. That is what Alfred Wegener actually postulated in his book titled The Origin of the Continent and the Ocean, which we have said was later considered as Virginia's theory of continental drift. Now, the continent that was a single landmass, or the block that was considered as a single landmass, 
was called Pangea. And this Pangea was surrounded by a giant sea that was called Panthalassia. That takes us back to the diagram that we had at the beginning. Now, when you look at it, we find that these are continents. These are continents. We can even recognize them from their different shape. If you take, for example, that there. Now, these continents were all attached. They were all found together. And being a single landmass or a block, Afrowegina named it Pangea. And he said that this Pangea, which is this single landmass, was surrounded by this sea, the blue portion that you find. It was surrounded by the sea, and that sea was a giant sea that he named Panthalassia. So, Panthalassia, the giant sea, surrounded the single landmass or block that was called Pangea. Now, as time moved on, the Pangea broke up and drifted, producing large continents. It separated, drifted apart, producing large, two large continents. And what were the two large continents? We had Laurasia, which is also considered as the northern block or the northern hemisphere. That is the continent that actually migrated or moved up north towards the northern hemisphere. So Laurasia was the supercontinent that moved towards the northern hemisphere and it was so, therefore it was called the northern block. And the part of Pangea that separated and moved towards the southern pole or the southern hemisphere was called Gondwana land or the southern block. Now, since they separated into two giant continents, they were separated, they were actually what? Connected by a sea. That was called the Teti Sea. The sea had an east-west orientation. And this sea was called the Teti Sea. Now, relics of this sea is found along, along the Mediterranean. So, there along that line or that portion, in the north, we have Laurasia, And towards the south pole, we had Gondwana land. This is a block diagram that illustrate what we are trying to say. So this is the supercontinent Laurasia, which is towards the south, the northern hemisphere, and the block, which is towards the southern hemisphere. So this is Gondwana land, and that is uh, Laurasia. And these two continents were separated by, an, remember we said, east-west sea, by an east-west sea that we named it the Tetis Sea. And relics of this sea is found along the Mediterranean. Now, later, at about 270 million years ago, at about 270 million years ago, the continent continued splitting and Laurasia actually broke forming the, the present-day continents that we call Europe, Asia, North America, and Greenland. So, some 270 million years ago, Laurasia, that was the northern block, separated and gave rise to the present-day continent that we call Europe, Asia, North America, and Laurasia. And Gondwana land itself also break forming the continents of the, the present day continent of the south, which are Africa, Australia, South America, India, Antarctica, and Arabia. So, I'll take it again. Gondwana land separated and gave rise to a present day continents that are called Africa. This is Africa here. We have South American block. The Indian block or continent, we have Antarctica, Antarctica, that is it, and Arabian continent, which is up, and also the Australian block. Those were the continent of Gondwana land that were formed during some 270 million years ago. 
Now, when they separated, they did not stay in the same position. They were actually what? Migrating, moving. And the Americas moved northward and also eastward. Northward and also. And you had Africa that moved westward. Australia, that was formerly united to Southeast Africa, moved towards the Northeast. And you had India. India. Remember, we've said that India formerly was a portion of Gondwana land. And therefore, it should be found towards the Southern Hemisphere. But when you look at the present day India, you find that it is found attached to Eurasia, the block that constituted the Northern Hemisphere, Laurasia. So, what happened? That is because some 70 million years back, India started moving northward, as it is indicated there. The India started moving northward and right up to the age of about 10 million years back that it collided with Eurasia, giving rise to the present day India that we have. And because of that collision, we had the formation of the Himalayas, the, whole, the Himalayan Four Mountain Range. That is it, as you have it on your screen. Now, what are the effects of continental drift? What are the effects of continental drift? The very first one is that the present day distribution of features like continents is as a result of what? The drifting of those continents. Because the different continents, after separating from the super giant continent Pangaea to Laurasia and Gondwana land, as they started moving in a different direction, some of them collided. Some of them gave rise to what? A present day continents that we have, like Africa, Africa, Australia, and even the South American and North American continent. It, it has also led to what? The oceans on the Earth's surface, the formation of oceans on the Earth's surface. It is thanks to continental drift that we've had formation of oceans on the Earth's surface. The second important effect of continental drift is the formation of fold and rocky mountain ranges. Fold and rocky mountains. You have a good example, the Andes Fold Mountain, which is actually formed as a result of the South American plate colliding with a minor plate, which we call the Nazca Plate. And that continent is actually a very long fold mountain range that runs from the northern portion of the South American continent right down to the southern portion of that continent. We also have Himalayan fold mountain range, which is the Mount the fold mountain range formed when India collided with the Eurasian continent some 10 million years ago. It gave rise to that Himalayas. And remember that the highest peak on Earth or the highest spot on Earth is found along that Himalaya, which is the Everest. Now, that has also brought about what? Distribution of earthquakes. It is when you study the, co the concept of continental drift, you get to understand why you would not have some particular type of earthquakes in some particular regions of the world, like tectonic uh, earthquakes. You understand why it is only only some countries of the world or some plates are what they are subjected to such types of natural hazard while others are not now even though the concept of continental drift has explained a lot but it also has a lot of limitations or drawbacks there are also a lot of limitations to that concept one of them is it does not explain how and why continents drifted. It does not explain how and why the continents drifted. Remember we said we had Pangaea to Laurasia and Gondwana land and to present day continent. The fact is, all of those were formed from present day to Laurasia and Gondwana land were formed by what? Separating from Pangaea. Why did they separate? That concept has not explained why. 
or it does not explain why. And the mechanism in which the movement occur in the mechanism that explains how they separated. All of that was not explained in the concept of continental drift. That is the very first weakness or drawback of that concept. We have the second, which is theory assumes that the shape of the continents have remained the same on change. Now, I'll take you to a very good example. When we look at the shape of the west coast of the African plate or continent and the east coast of the South American continent. According to Wegener, he says, when those two are brought together, they actually fit like a jigsaw puzzle. They fit like a puzzle. Now, and that gives what you call, what he named Pangea. Now, but the reality is that those coastlines has been undergoing denudational processes. So, it is obvious that they have not remained the same since they separated from Pangea or from Gondwana land. Of course, they have been undergoing breakdown processes. So it's not possible that the shape has remained the same all through. Now, the next limitation is theory does not consider oceans. When you look at the different continents that we have, the present day continent, you find that those continents are separated by massive oceans. Wegener did not explain how those oceans were formed, that is their origin and why they were formed. So it is a limitation to that concept. We have other limitations, which is nothing about the formation of the ocean floor, of course. Remember one of the evidences of sea floor spreading dating the rocks of the ocean floor. So, of course, the ocean floor is made up of rocks. And how was that ocean floor formed? That was not explained in the concept of continental drift. It is a weakness. Similar vegetation is found in unrelated part of the world. Now, in one of the evidences of this, Wegener tried to talk about what? Fossils, fossil plants that were found in the different continents that are widely separated. So he said that it is possible that those plants would have only, the fossil plants would have only existed due at the time of Gondwana land or Pangea. So it is possible that plants or vegetation can grow in different locations of the world even without the drifting. Now, rocks of the same age are similar characteristics are found in other parts of the world. One of the evidences that supports this concept is that when you match the rocks of, for example, the African continent and the South American continent, the rocks of Appalachian and Scandinavia mountains, they have the same characteristics and ages. That is one of the evidence that he used to explain Pangea. But it's possible to have rocks of the same ages and characteristics that are located in widely separated continents, not necessarily being formed at the time of Pangaea, as Wegener explained. Now, recall, summarily, we have been talking about Wegener theory of continental drift, which he says that at the beginning, some 200 million years back, we had, or 270 million years back, we had a single landmass or a single block that was called Pangaea. And this Pangaea was a giant supercontinent that was surrounded by a massive sea that he called Pantalassia. And this Pangaea break forming two supercontinents. You had Laurasia in the north and we had Gondwana land in the south. Now the Laurasia in the north later separated, giving rise to the present-day continents we know as Europe, Asia, North America, and Greenland. And Gondwana land gave rise to the continent, present-day continent called Africa, Australia, South America, and India, Antarctica, and Arabia. That takes us back to the real-life situation that we had at the beginning, which was for you to observe the picture and come out with a geologic concept that can be used to explain 
what the picture is trying to exemplify or the picture is illustrating. Now, the question, the scientific problem, well, what geologic concept will be used to describe the phenomena illustrated by the picture? And the hypothesis, well, the Earth has not been the same since its origin. Now, following what we just saw, or what we've just learned, you know that the Earth has not been the same since its origin. That is true, but then it does not give us the concept that can be used to explain why the Earth has not been the same since its origin. We've had volcanism. We've said that volcanism is a process in which molten material in the interior gets to the soft into or on the surface of the earth. Seismology, which is a science that deals with the study of earthquakes, and so therefore that leaves us with a continent of continental drift, as postulated by or brought forth by Alfred Wegener in uh, 1915, the, in the early 90s. So that is it. The concept of continental drift is what that picture is illustrating. How the earth was. So 200 million years and how it gave rise to the present day continent that we have. That takes us to the exercises of the day. And we'll start with the very first one, which is the gradual splitting and horizontal displacement of supercontinent to form the present continent is described as is it sea floor spreading, plate tectonics, continental drift, or tectonics? What is the correct answer? Gradual splitting and horizontal displacement of supercontinent to form present day continent. The answer should be continental drift. That is the concept of continental drift. The next question is the southern hemisphere supercontinent was called, that is, the block that moved towards the south or the southern block. How was it called? Was it Gondwana land, Laurasia, Pangaea, or Pantalassia? The correct answer is Gondwana land, as you have it on your screen. And the next question the East West Sea separating Laurasia and Gondwana land continent was called, or is called? Now, remember, we said that when Pangaea separated into a supercontinent called Laurasia, that moved to the north, and uh, Gondwana land, that moved towards the south. It was separated by a sea that had an east-west orientation, and relics of that sea is along the Mediterranean. So how was that sea called? Is it Tetis, Pantalassia, Indian Sea, or Pangaea? The correct answer is Thetis Sea. That is the name of the sea, the east-west sea that separated Gondwana land from Laurasia. The assignment of the day will be for you to list the continent of the first Gondwana land. That's the present-day continent that make up Gon that made Gondwana land. The continent of Laurasia, and you also outline the major and minor plates major and minor plates for further reading and verification you can use the following textbooks that you have on your screen they were used to establish the lesson so you have ordinary level geology for form 4 and 5 science by Kenneth Yosimbo and others we have come to the end of our lesson our next lesson will be evidences to support the theory of continental drift. What are some of the proofs that support that theory of continental drift? See you in our next lesson. Manetambia niña ne injo biayen